Hey there, everybody. I hope you're doing well. We did a little biochar session last night in our old little washing tub. And, um, you know, pretty good burn. Stuck like two and a half whole trees in there. Some of it did not completely pyrolyze. And that's okay. We've got a few big-ish chunks left, but some of the other stuff breaks apart real nice. You can see that really awesome structure in there. This is uh, fully saturated at this point, but there you go. Nice and crispy crunchy. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this batch, but I've been hesitant in recent times to uh, talk more about this because my setup is not great. There are holes in the side. They're actually right right where I am. There are holes in the side. There are holes in the bottom of this, um, which does make quenching and draining a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, it's it's not perfect. Nothing ever really is, but it's also not, you know, super awesome like some other folks set up or setups are, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. Um, but I had a conversation recently with someone who is a soil scientist, which is uh, an awesome profession. And while I dabble, it's certainly not uh, my speciality, as it were. But one of the things that they were talking about is that the temperature and the oxygen with which you make your biochar has effects on how quickly it breaks down in the soil, how quickly it mineralizes, how quickly it releases any locked up potential nutrients or things of that nature, and how long it will stay, the stability of the carbon. Um, there are some really neat charts and graphs that are in the research paper that is going to be linked in the description of this video. And um, there's a pretty close relationship between the temperature of the kiln or uh, vessel or the fire itself, I guess. Um, there is a, a very clear, there is a very clear almost one-to-one -one relationship with the temperature with which you create the biochar and its long-term stability in the soil. And I am here to tell you that your imperfect biochar is probably better than you think. Um, you're still going to be adding things like calcium and magnesium and huge amounts of carbon to the soil, but that carbon may be remineralized very quickly, or that calcium might be uptaken very quickly, um, depending on whether you had achieved a very high temperature with a very low uh, amount of oxygen in the pyrolysis. Um, but if you've got lower temperatures or higher oxygen content, uh, in your, your char session, you're likely going to see an impact anyway, but you may have to re-up the application, uh, in a shorter than, you know, hundred or thousand year span of time, which honestly, um, seems okay. Uh, if you're integrating that carbon, if you're integrating those minerals, if you're allowing your system to use an imperfect burn to help it rebalance, buffer, uh, and provide that amount of nutrient cycling potential to your system, um, you're going to see results. They might not be the stellar results that you wanted. Uh, they may very likely not be hugely impactful in the first couple of seasons, but if you're doing it relatively consistently and if you're thinking about the rate at which you're applying them and what you are supplying 
to the rest of the inputs over that biochar that you're integrating in whatever fashion you are. Um, you're just going to be improving those soils and allowing for a greater amount of nutrient cycling and higher efficiencies in your gardens. And it's looking like it's soon to be time for some kids to go to jelly school. So uh, we'll be back in just a moment. And if we know that it's going to break down more quickly, if we know that it will remineralize more quickly, if we believe it will have a liming effect, or if we think that it will have an outsized uh, halting of certain processes, does that open us up to a wider array of applications than just digging it into the soil and using it as a quote-unquote permanent soil amendment? Because if we're true about it, if we're honest about it, then we can use this information to get the kind of carbon structure and breakdown type that is best for the system or the particular task for which we are using it. And we don't have to rigidly apply it in only one direction. So we're down here in the woods. Um, you'll notice that there is a huge amount of sky up there now, but that's for another video. Right now, we're talking about biochar dumped on top of another layer. Uh, those of you who have been with us for a while may remember the beaver dam analog berms that we are using to build up bed structures in the wood and then allowing it to molder as we build up the stock for pulses of new vegetation in the woods. But so, um, in this berm here, which is going to be the subject of probably the rest of me talking about this, um, it was sticks, and then we dumped a bunch of biochar in, and then we dumped a bunch of duck bedding in, and we allowed it to break down for a year, and it dropped about four inches in height from the breakdown. And a little hand digging through, I saw very, very little of the big chunks of biochar. Um, it's probably because I walked on it uh, quite a bit. That probably added to the amount of depression in this berm. But now we've added a new run of biochar in slightly bigger chunks and have brought down another set of the duck bedding. And this will be allowed to molder once again. And my thought is that next season, so I guess in spring, we should be able to plant a row of something in here. There will be soil admixture from all of the nutrient that is still in the hay that is used for the bedding. There is a ton of additional nutrient in the form of all of the manure. And again, uh, ducks are stinky, stinky creatures. There's a lot of poop in here. And this gives us an opportunity to rebalance the amount of oxygen and provide a wider bevy of soil microorganisms the opportunity to habitate this space. And so another application could be grinding it up extra fine, even finer than, than this stuff. So like powderizing it and top dressing, using it as a topical application, providing a liming effect to highly acidic soils, um, providing whatever bits of ash are still in there to the topmost section of the growing space of the soil profile, and possibly providing that, that little bit of trace element that allows things to green up in the way that ash and char does. And so I guess this is really just a long-winded way of saying that if you're thinking about making biochar, if you're thinking about trying it, and you are paralyzed by the idea that if you do it wrong, it won't be permanent carbon. And I am here to tell you that that is okay, 
and that there is a wider array of application options than just digging a hole and burying the carbon. You can do so much more with it. So, those are my thoughts on biochar. And I just want to encourage you all to, um, to get out there and do it if you have the inclination and an application that you can use it for. So, till next time, thanks for watching. Happy planting.